Hello, my bookish friends. Welcome or welcome back. I am Elizabeth. This is Reading Riley. And today I've got a special video in store for you. We're going to be talking about Q3 new release books in the horror and thriller category. When I say Q3, what I actually mean is July, August, and September. So these are all books that are going to be coming out in the next three months of 2022. Let me specify. And let me tell you, we've got some bangers. I have just under 30 books here. It's a lot. It's a lot. There are a couple more speculative ones, but I think the majority of these are horror books. Found some indie ones too. And I'm excited about these. A lot of these I have not heard of before. And so I think some of these are going to be new for you as well. So keep your eyes open. I'm going to separate these in the chapters down below. So if you're interested in specific ones, feel free to double tap with two fingers if you're watching on your phone and that'll take you right to the next one. Also, if you enjoy videos such as this one, feel free to give this a like, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. I'll also add my other social media things over here. Everything's Reading Riley. Reach out to me over there if you like as well. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get into some of these books. I'm so excited. I am gonna tell you these in order of release date. So we're gonna start with July. On July 5th, we have The Paul Bearers Club by Paul Tremblay. This is said to be a psychological thriller about an unsettling friendship. We're following Art. He's a 17-year-old high school loner. This is set in New England in the 1980s. Art isn't a hair metal. He also has started a club for volunteer pallbearers to help with poorly attended funerals. I think maybe Art has a crush on this girl. It's supposed to be like the coolest girl you ever met and holy crap, she is into my pallbearers club. So they make this friendship, but she has this weird thing about New England folklore and digging up the dead and it's kind of strange. And I think we have a dual timeline because it says decades later, Art is writing a book. He's writing some kind of memoir about these weird folklore things in New England. But his friend, this girl, gets a hold of the manuscript and she doesn't like it. And it says now she's making cuts. I don't know what that means. It says this is blurring the lines between memory and fiction. So we may have an unreliable narrator here. It also says it creates the suspenseful portrait of this very disconcerting relationship. So I hope, I hope we're getting the kind of energy that we got from things have gotten worse since we last spoke by Eric LaRocca because that would be great. Paul Bearer's Club is 288 pages. So on the short side. Next, we have an interesting one. This is nonfiction, I believe, and it's called Couple Found Slain After a Family Murder. This is by Makita Brotman, and it comes out on July 6th. This is 256 pages, right in that sweet spot for me. So about the author, Makita is a British scholar, psychoanalyst, author, and cultural critic. Known for her psychological readings of dark and pathological elements of contemporary culture. Need I continue? So from what I gather, this is a nonfiction, almost like expose into the underworld of forensic psych wards in America. So we're following this guy, Brian, who in 1992 admitted to killing his own parents. He then went to trial and said he was possessed by the devil. He was then diagnosed with schizophrenia and ruled not criminally responsible. So he was sent to a psychiatric hospital where he stayed for 27 years. From what I'm gathering, Makita Brotman interviewed him about his experience in the psych ward. He said he's tried to escape. He's been shot by police. He's witnessed three patient on patient murders. He's experienced drugging of patients beyond recognition and this sadistic system of rewards and punishments that had gone on in there. So I think this is really going to be about our system, about what happens to those people once they're forgotten about, once they're in the system, and especially him in particular, Brian, and the forgotten lives of those held there often indefinitely. So this sounds really interesting to me. Next on July 12th at 176 pages, this is the shorter one, we have What Moves the Dead by T. Kingfisher. A lot of people have had arcs of this already and seem to be enjoying it. So I'm really looking forward to this. This is a retelling of Edgar Allan Poe's The Fall of the House of Usher, which I've not read either. The thing that intrigues me about this is there is a fungal growth situation 
which I really enjoyed in Mexican Gothic, and so maybe I'll like it here too. We're following Alex Easton, who is a retired soldier. They get word that their childhood friend, Madeline Usher, is dying, and they race to the ancestral home of the Ushers in this remote countryside, and what they find is a nightmare of fungal growths and possessed wildlife. Don't know what that means. Madeline apparently sleepwalks. She's like speaking in tongues or something. Her brother has a malady of nerves, which sounds super old timey and fun <laughs> in a dark way. And Alex is on a quest to reveal what the hell is going on here. Very much giving me Mexican Gothic energy. Next on July 12th, at a whopping 432 pages, we have one of my most anticipated books, one of my favorite authors, and that is Ruth Ware's The It Girl. This is supposed to be a dark academia, which she doesn't typically do. So I'm intrigued. We'll see. I have kind of a love-hate thing with Dark Academia. This is set at Oxford and we're following Hannah Jones. So when Hannah Jones first went to Oxford, she met April. She's said to be vivacious, bright, sometimes vicious. She's the it girl. She's the one everyone wants to be. They cultivate this group of friends, which is absolutely reminding me of In My Dreams I Hold a Knife. And by the end of the second semester, April is found dead. So now we have a dual timeline. We're we're fast forwarding to a decade later. Hannah has moved on. She has a life of her own. The guy who was accused of this murder has died in prison. But then a journalist comes knocking at her door and has new evidence that points to the fact that perhaps this guy wasn't actually the killer of April. And we go from there. I'm sure madness ensues. All of the friend groups have something to hide. It's one of them, no doubt. Hopefully this is good. I've heard mixed reviews. I'm nervous. I'm very nervous. Next on July 12th, we have Upgrade by Blake Crouch. This is one of the two, I think I have two sci-fi books on this list, but Blake Crouch is just an auto buy. I loved Dark Matter. I loved Recursion. I'm sure this will be good as well. This one is reminding me of Lucy. If you've ever seen the movie Lucy with Scarlett Johansson. Also, what's the other one? Limitless, I think it's with Bradley Cooper. Very much kind of the same trope. This is three 352 pages and we're following Logan Ramsey. The description starts out saying you are the next step in the human evolution. Logan Ramsey is starting to notice a difference in his brain. He's starting to read a little faster, comprehend a little bit better. He's getting smarter. He's better at multitasking, etc. He's starting to see the people around him and the world in general in a new light. And what happened is Logan's genome was hacked. Dun, dun, dun. Apparently Logan has this horrific family legacy, which is the reason why he has been chosen for this. It all harkens back to some dark history, some dark family past. But what I think we will discover is that this is just the first step in something that is a much larger scaled plan to kind of probably world domination, let's be real, that some sinister rich person is trying to take, have. And it seems that Logan is the only person who can stop this from happening, whatever it is. So <laughs> that's the general gist. It says, what if humanity's only hope for a future really does lie in engineering our own evolution? It's a curious thought. It's a curious question. I'm sure it's going to be very scientific, very detailed, very interesting with amazing world building, which is what I come to expect from Blake Crouch. This next one's really interesting, actually. This was actually written in the 1960s, but is finally being translated into English by an Italian author named Giorgio De Maria, or Giorgio De Maria. And this is a 264-page anthology. It's called The Transgressionists and Other Disquieting Works. This includes two novellas, two short stories, and a short dystopian teleplay, which I don't even know what that is, but it says dystopian, so I'm in. Um, and apparently this guy, Giorgio De Maria, is known in Italy to be a really weird and eccentric fiction writer. He tends to draw inspiration from occultism, secret societies, radical politics, which all sounds amazing to me and right up my alley. The title story called The Transgressionists, which was written in 1968, is about malicious telepaths who meet in the cafes and jazz clubs of the 1960s Turin to plot world domination. There's another one called The End of Everydayism, where a group of 
futuristic artists use corpses as a medium for their art. It sounds interesting, so I threw it on the list. Next, on July 19th at 400 pages, we have Black Mouth by Ronald Malfi. I have not read any of his work yet, but I've heard really good things, and this one sounded interesting. And this says it's perfect for fans of It by Stephen King, so. It sounds very similar. We've got a bunch of kids, friend group, and I think a dual timeline. Let's see. Yeah, I think this has kind of like a magical aspect to it. We're following Jamie Warren, who has been traumatized by his childhood, where he disconnected from his disabled brother. And something happened this summer when they were kids where they were taught this magic by this really strange man. But then this series of events kind of reunites him with his childhood gang and brings up what happened that summer to the point where they cannot deny it and they have to then kind of confront their dark history together. Next on July 19th at 384 pages, we have Dead Water by C.A. Fletcher. This one only has 12 reviews, but it has bad reviews on Goodreads so far. So I'm kind of trying to keep an open mind here. There's a rabbit on the cover. I've already <laughs> sent a message to Kayla at Books and Lala, like uh, bad reviews on Goodreads, rabbit on the cover. It's horror. I was like, read this. She already knew about it, of course. So it says there's a waterborne blight that hits this remote island community. So we have isolation trope here. I think this is going to be a weird one. I think it's going to be a really weird one. The islanders are a mix of people who have grown up there and then people that were just looking for like a quieter life. But they also all have their own secrets. Rumor has it that this blight, this waterborne blight might be some kind of waterborne neural infection from the shellfish farm, a case of mass hysteria or even long buried curse. So is it parent? normal? Is it some kind of weird infection? I don't know. Sounds interesting. I'm open to reading it. It says a haunting suspenseful tale of isolation and dread within a small island community. Sounds good to me. We'll see. Next again on July 19th at 352 pages we have Just Like Home. This is by Sarah Gailey. In this book, we're following Vera, who is moving back into her childhood home at the request of her mother. But the interesting thing about this is that this home, where her father lived as well growing up, is the home of a serial killer. Because her father was a serial killer, is a serial killer. I don't know if he's still alive or what. And he actually buried the bodies of the people in this home. So it's more than just like coming back to your childhood home. This is like traumatizing shit here. There's this weird artist that's moved into the guest house and Vera does not like them. It says they are slowly stripping Vera's childhood for spare parts. I don't know what that means. There's someone leaving notes around the house and this artist says it's not them, but it's in her father's handwriting. So is it a ghost? What's going on? Is her father even alive? I have no idea. There are secrets yet undiscovered in the foundations of the notorious Crowder house. Vera must face them and find out for herself just how deep the rot goes. Again on July 19th, this is a big day. It's a big day. At 416 pages, we have Mary, An Awakening of Terror by Nat Cassidy. This is a debut novel and the comps here are Midsummer and American Psycho. Oh, and a pinch of I'll Be Gone in the Dark. So we're looking at psychopaths, true crime potentially, culty things, I don't know. I wonder if this is a possession book. So we're following Mary, she's middle-aged. It seems like she's kind of quiet, she just wants to blend in, she doesn't want to stand out. She's having hot flashes, she's having body aches, but also she's having these weird spells where she can't look in the mirror without passing out. She's had voices in her head telling her to do weird things. She gets fired from her job in New York, so she decides to move back home. She's hoping to reconnect with her past, with her inner self, to find herself again. But she starts having these visions of mutilated specters. What is a specter? And she starts auto writing these strange things. But then she discovers that these things that are happening to her also happened to this infamous serial killer. So what is the connection? What's happening there? Is this paranormal or is she losing it? Like what's going on, Mary? Let's figure it out. Oh, it also says then the killings start to happen again. Is Mary doing it? Again, on July 19th, we have at 352 pages, which seems to be a very popular page number. We have Things We Do in the Dark by Jennifer Hillier. I got an advanced copy from Book of the Month. 
Very excited for this. Jennifer Hillier it has become one of my favorite authors. I just read the description of this for the first time. I never even knew what it was about. I was just like, yes, this is for me. I'm getting it. I want this book. We're following Paris Peralta. She's arrested standing in her bathroom over her dead husband's body, who her husband is also a celebrity. She's got a razor in her hand. She looks guilty as fuck. She knows she's going to be charged with murder. But are we surprised she has a hidden past? She's not as worried about getting charged with murder as she is with being exposed by the media attention. Apparently 25 years earlier, this chick named Ruby went to jail for a different murder in this trial that really shook Canada to their bones in the early 90s. Ruby knows who Paris really is. And when she's unexpectedly released from prison, she threatens to expose Paris for who she actually is. It says that Paris now has to, is she's forced to confront her past. But the only thing worse than being charged with the murder of her husband is of course being charged with two murders. So did she commit that first murder as well? Did she not commit any of them? I don't know, we'll find out. Okay, I have two more July 19th releases and then we'll move on to August. So the first one, this is an anthology that I found that's um, 320 pages total. It's called Other Terrors, an inclusive anthology, which off the bat, the title I'm interested in. This was edited by Vince A. Liagino, Liaguno, Liaguno, and Rena Mason. And this is a horror anthology told by authors from underrepresented backgrounds about what it means to feel othered. And I love when horror books do this. I love this comparison of other and how we can connect horror stories to this kind of real life social commentary about what it feels like to be other because when you are different, people are afraid of you. And so that connection is a real thing. So I think this should be intriguing. There's some really great authors that are writing in here. We have Tananarive Du, Jennifer McMahon, S.A. Cosby, Stephen Graham Jones, Al Makatsu, and a whole bunch of other authors. Um, it says, be they a different culture, a different background, a different sexual preference, a different belief system, or different skin color, some people simply aren't part of the dominant community and are perceived as scary. So this should be an interesting anthology. And our last book on July 19th at 368 pages, a little bit on the longer side, is The Swell by Allie Reynolds. She wrote Shiver, which I read last year and really, really enjoyed. That one I compared as well to In My Dreams I Hold a Knife. I thought it was just really well done about a bunch of snowboarders. This one is about surfers. So this is a thriller. It says it's point break meets and then there were none. I'm always nervous when people compare books to and then there were none <laughs> because it's just you're shooting yourself in the foot before you even get started. But we'll see. It says it's a pulse pounding beach read that explores the dangerous ties between a group of elite surfers who are determined to find the perfect ways at any cost, even murder. We're following Kenna Ward, who three years ago lost her boyfriend who drowned while they were surfing. And since then, she has not surfed at all. She's so she's really lost the two loves of her life surfing and her boyfriend. But her best friend suddenly announces her engagement to this guy that she's never met before. So of course she's got to go meet this guy. He belongs to this really tight-knit group of surfers. Kenna ends up traveling to this Australian beach where it's just really isolated, not a lot of people around. They have kind of like claimed this beach as their own, this group of surfers. But members of this group start to go missing. And so Kenna realizes that in order to like protect her friend, she has to become one of them. So she has to face her fear, get back in the ocean and suss out the situation from the inside. It's exploring the dangerous edge between passion and obsession. I'm sure it's gonna be great. I really liked the last book that I read from her. All right, next we're gonna be moving on to all the books that I am excited for in August. And this first one comes out on August 2nd at 304 pages. It is called The Book Eaters by Sun Yi or Sun Yi Dean. Out on the Yorkshire Moors, there's a secret line of people who eat books. Stay with me here. Books are their food. They eat books and they retain the information that is within those books. We have this play on words, this play on this idea of eating versus consuming. Are you still with me here? So for them, like a romance novel would be dessert. A spy book might be a nice little tasty snack. They can eat a map and just know where everything is from there forever forward. 
And when they get in trouble, they have to eat dictionaries. I'm sure it doesn't taste very good. It's very dry. We we'll also have some commentary here about women and what women are supposed to consume and how women are supposed to behave. So we're following Devin, who's grown up in this community and her brothers, they get to eat all the good shit. They get to eat all these stories about valor, adventure, and Devin, like all other book eater women, has to eat fairy tales, stories of princesses, stories about how women should shut the fuck up and not say anything and not do anything. Cautionary tales, if you will. Devin, of course, discovers that real life is not like the fairy tales. And she learns this the hard way when she has a son who doesn't want to eat books, but instead wants to eat human minds. Done. Done. I want to read it. All right, next. Okay. Whew. This next book is real interesting because I've started reading it. This is an indie author. I've started reading this book and I think it might be the darkest thing I've ever read in my life. This is called I Will Kill You, a psychological thriller. This is by Halo Scott. I'm about 100 pages into it and I hate it, but I cannot stop. And I don't know if I hate it. Like, I don't know if I hate it or love it. I don't know. It's definitely dark. Okay, so we're following Alex, who is a self proclaimed psychopath. He's a single father. He's lost his wife to cancer, I believe. I think she kind of brought out the softer side of him. She made him a better person. But now that she's gone, he doesn't have anything to cling on to and he embraces his darkness. He is tired of being poor. And so he starts this business. This is set in New York in Manhattan. He's built this huge organization, this corporation where they basically clean up dead bodies and he takes really, really good care of his employees so that they don't snitch. I and mean, anyone who does or that gets in his way, he just kills. But then he meets Emma, who is a genius. They see likeness in each other and they connect on this weird level and it becomes this like cat and mouse thing. But along the way, like it's just so, so fucked up. Also, oh, okay. The cool, coolest thing about this so far though, and one of the reasons I can't put it down is because it's got this kind of meta quality to it where you're inside his mind, in the psychopath's mind, but he's talking to you as his imaginary friend named Bob. And you are there with him. He assumes what you're thinking the whole time. It's very clever. It's very witty. And he always is like constantly calling himself out. So all of the things that are like really disgusting and like fucked up, he's like talking to you as you're reading it. And he's like, look, I know, I know what you're thinking. I know. I look, I get it. But this is just how it is. I'm sorry if you can't handle it. He even like mentions the author within it saying like this guy's real fucked up, you know, and like, I don't know, it's something that's so engaging about it that I just cannot put down. It's so weird. There's this disclaimer when they sent me the the arc request thing. It says disclaimer, this book is viciously dark. This book will not give you a hug. It does not play well with others. It will not rub your back and sing you a lullaby. No, this book is a bloody prickly infected beast that wants to rip you open and feast on your intestines while shrieking opera and twerking over your moldy carcass with its fellow zombified word monsters. It will throw you on the pavement and smash your head with a baseball bat and then eat your brain out of your shattered skull while carving open your chest to harvest the rest of your organs to sell on the black market. It will weave your arteries into a vascular quilt, snap off your ribs to build a bone xylophone, grill your lungs while still attached and drink wine out of your bladder while peeling off your face one strip at a time with a rusty pair of pliers coated in chunky pus soaked vomit. There is nothing appropriate, subtle or merciful about this book. And it's true. It's very true. I think some people would be very offended by this book. So just be warned. I haven't finished it yet. I have no like conclusion on my thoughts or whatever, but I'm intrigued. Let's just say that. Oh, also everybody in this book is gay. Like everyone's gay. You know, maybe a little bit improbable, but everyone's gay. 
and that's cool. Next on August 9th, we have The Women Can Fly by Megan Giddings. This is the author of Lakewood, which I have not read, but I still want to read it as on my TBR. But this one sounds really interesting, even though I don't typically, in a general sense, like witchy books. This one sounds pretty up my alley. It says it's reminiscent of Margaret Atwood, of Octavia Butler, of Shirley Jackson. Though I don't really love Shirley Jackson, but I like I like the other two. Biting Social Commentary. It's a piercing dystopian novel about the bond between this young woman and her mysterious mother. In this dystopia, the state mandates women to marry by the age of 30. And if you do not get married by the time you're 30, you have to enroll in this registry that allows you to be monitored constantly. You basically give up your free will. Also, witches are real. We're following Josephine Thomas, whose mother disappeared. Some people have said that her mother was a witch. And it's kind of a disconcerting rumor because the witches are real and because they can be crucified. And especially being a black woman, Josephine's worried. Jo's 28, she's ambivalent about marriage, but she has to start making decisions if she doesn't want to give up her autonomy. And she's also kind of investigating the disappearance of her mother, trying to figure out what happened. And when she gets the chance, the opportunity to fulfill one of her mother's last wishes, she leaves her regular life to feel connected to her mother one last time. Something's gonna happen, I don't know. I don't know, I haven't read it. This book explores the limitations that women face and the powers they have to transgress and transcend them. So it's definitely gonna be a feminist book. Sounds really great. All right, next on August 9th, we have Stay Awake by Megan Golden. I have come to really enjoy this author's writing. I have a NetGalley e-arc, but I have not. I've just started it and haven't gotten farther. I'm really bad with ebooks, you guys. This is 352 pages again. This is following Liv Reese, who wakes up in the backseat of a taxi with no idea how she got there, what's going on. She says, okay, take me back home. She gets home and it's not her apartment. She looks at her arm and it says, stay awake on her arm. This is kind of hitting that trope of Memento, if you remember that movie. Um, there's also a book, S.J. Watson's Before I Go to Sleep, which is also a book and a movie, I believe. I think Memento's a book too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, also set in New York City, she finds this knife on her. Apparently when she falls asleep, she loses time. There's also these murders that have happened that she thinks she may or may not be responsible for. She doesn't know, she has no recollection, she has no memory of it. So we're trying to figure out why this is happening to her. Did she kill these people or did she not? And what the hell is going on? It sounds really good. I think I might end up waiting for the audiobook when this actually comes out because I'm just so bad with reading physically already. And then if it's ebook, like even more so. So we'll see. The next book I have comes out on August 16th and it is 400 pages and that is The Last Housewife by Ashley Winstead. She is the author of In My James I Hold a Knife, which I've already mentioned like two or three times during this video. So as you can probably assume, I'm excited for this one. Although this one is supposed to be really heavy hitting. It's supposed to have a lot of abuse in here. So um, we'll see. I know Ashley from Ashley's Little Library has read this and did not love it as much because of that aspect. I tend to have the same triggers for that one at least. And so I'm a little bit nervous about it as well, but I'm sure the writing will be great either way. This has kind of a culty theme to it. So we're following Shay Evans. And when she was in college in upstate New York, she and her friends meet this really captivating man. He starts to string this web of lies and to pull them into his plot. He's manipulative. He is charming. You know, your average typical cult leader. He basically like put them under the spell and now it's eight years later and her and her friend Laurel were the only ones of their friend group who made it out of this cult. She's built a new life in a Texas suburb. I live in Texas too, so I'm excited for that. But when she hears this terrible news of Laurel's death delivered on a true crime podcast, she begins to think that this past that she thought she buried is very much still alive and may come back to haunt her. So she teams up with this podcaster and they kind of investigate what's happening. When she gets back into it, her kind of old sensations are reawakening, reigniting. Can she think on her own? Has she been conditioned to behave a certain way because of the time that she spent in this cult? And can she get out once she gets back in? It sounds really, really good. There's supposed to be a lot of trigger warnings on this. So just be aware of that if that's something Thing, especially, you know, manipulation, gaslighting, cult type things get to you. Just be aware of that. 
Okay, this next one's really interesting. I hadn't heard of this one. It's released on August 16th. It's 258 pages. And this is called Anybody Home by Michael Seidlinger. Seidlinger, what came first, the home or the desire to invade? This is about home invasions, taking a classic trope, turning it on its head. Basically, we're following this seasoned house invader who is now training a group of people to do the same thing. And it's supposed to be really unnerving and really chilling. It goes over from the initial canvassing to the home entry, and it takes the reader along the ride. So it makes you feel complicit as you're reading the book. Could be kind of scary. I Home invasion is really scary for a lot of us, I think. So we'll see how this one goes. It says, examining the sanctuary of the home and one of the horror genre's most frightening tropes. Anybody home points the camera lens onto the quiet suburbs and its unsuspecting abodes. Next, we have one of my most anticipated books again, coming out on August 23rd at 400 pages, and that is Girl Forgotten by Karen Slaughter. This is meant to be a sequel to Pieces of Her by Karen Slaughter, which was recently made into a TV adaptation on Hulu. Adaptation is really good. Pieces of Her is my least favorite of Karen Slaughter's books. If you're gonna start with Karen Slaughter, start with Pretty Girls. It's a standalone, it's amazing. Definitely read that before you read Pieces of Her because Pieces of Her is not her best work, though it's still good. It's still has that amazing character development that Karen Slaughter does. Um, it's just not her best work. But I'm excited to see where this one goes. We're following Andrea Oliver, who is now a US Marshal, and she gets pulled into this case. We have small towns, big secrets. There's, I think, a total timeline, prom night 1982, a woman, Emily Vaughn, gets murdered. She has a secret and by the end of the night, because of that secret, she gets murdered. And then in current timeline, 40 years later, we're following Andrea. She's a new US Marshal. She's kind of probably trying to get her footing, trying to see what's what. And she's sent to look at this different case. But she keeps getting sidetracked in hearing about this case of Emily Vaughn. Ever since she's heard the story, she's like haunted by this story and she cannot help but investigate it. So hopefully this one will be just stellar. I'm sure it'll be great. It's Karen Slaughter. It's Karen Slaughter. Okay, next at 352 pages and being released on August 30th is Daisy Darker by Alice Feeney. I got this arc from Beth at Beth Sell Booked and I actually have just finished this one and really liked it. Hang out for my June wrap up to see more thoughts about that. But essentially this is also said to be a nod to Agatha Christie's and then there were none, but this is the first one that I've read that has referenced and then there were none and not shot itself in the foot for it. It does have that, but it's subtle. It does its own thing. And here I am reviewing it. Um, <laughs> it's got that Alice Feeney twist that we come to expect and love. Uh, but anyway, we're following the Darker family. None of them get along. They don't really talk anymore, but it's Nana's 80th birthday. And so they're all getting together at Nana's house. She lives on this house. Um, on this tidal island where every night tide comes in and you're completely isolated, you're trapped on or off, and eight hours later when the tide goes out, you can then move freely again throughout the islands, I suppose. Everyone gets together on this night and people start dying. Every hour, somebody else dies. There's this secret among everybody that nobody's willing to share. These people will not talk to each other. Each character is distinct and really well written. You know, you gotta figure out the secrets of the Darker family. That's essentially it. Having already read it, definitely recommend it. Love Alice Feeney. And I just reviewed it, great. Also on August 30th, we have Suburban Hell by Maureen Kilmer. I just heard of this one today from Lauren over at Lauren Love Reads and it sounds really good. First of all, I love this cover. This cover is beautiful. And it's said to be Bad Moms meets My Best Friend's Exorcism, but the scenario is reminding me much more of the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, which makes me nervous because that book triggered the shit out of me. It's set in the Chicago Burbs. So you have these women who live in this cul-de-sac and are all friends. They have left the city and moved to the suburbs. And we're following Amy Foster, who considers herself very lucky for having done this because she found her place in this friend group with these other women. They call themselves the Mom Mafia. And one night they have this idea to make a clubhouse for themselves. It's a place where the kids can't go, where the dads can't go. It's like only for moms and wine in one of their backyards. 
And the first night that they christen this clubhouse, they have the ceremonial drink and they unleash a demon. I mean, yeah. One of the friends gets possessed. There's haunting things all around the neighborhood. There are dolls that move themselves. So they got to figure out how to exercise this demon. In that case, it does sound like my best friend's exorcism. Anyway, I think it's going to be hysterical. It sounds like it's going to be comedic. So um, hopefully this will be a good time. All right, next on August 30th at 352 pages again, we have Number One Fan by Meg Ellison. I don't know this author. This one just popped up and it sounded interesting. It says she created a beautiful world and now he wants it all. So we're following a an author, a novelist, and it sounds like she might write fantasy books, uh, but she's on her way to the speaking engagement. She gets in a cab. She accepts a drink from the driver, which I don't know why the hell you would do. Like, that's her first mistake. And then she wakes up chained in a stranger's basement. And I think this is a tale about obsession and survival. She realizes that her abduction may not be random and that she actually recognizes her captor. But she can't figure out what he wants other than the fact that He's very familiar with her books and he's very invested in the world that she's created. It says that this is set against the backdrop of convention culture and the Me Too reckoning. It examines the tension between creator and work, fandom and source material, and the rage of fans who feel like they own fiction. So it sounds really interesting. Now we're going to be moving on to September. The first one I have coming out on September 6th actually have an ARC copy of this at 279 pages. This is Eric LaRocca's newest book. He so wonderfully sent me an ARC of this, which I'm fangirling about. So for those of you who have been looking for this one and couldn't find it because it got sold out, I think they stopped printing this. This is Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke. He's now releasing this version, which is Things Have Gotten Worse Since We Last Spoke and, and, other misfortunes. We not only have this story within here, but we have, I think, two other short stories, if I remember correctly. Three dark and disturbing horror stories from an astonishing new voice. So if you couldn't get that one, September 6th, you can get that story plus more. I can't wait to read these. I'm so excited. I've come to really, really appreciate this author's work and the darkness, the darkness. It's very psychological and um, definitely recommend it if you haven't read it yet. Okay, just a few more here. Next, we have Full Immersion by Gemma Amor. I don't know this author. I just thought it sounded interesting. It's categorized as horror and fantasy. It does have a little bit of a fantasy element. This comes out on September 13th, and it is 400 pages. I'll probably wait for reviews on this one because I'm a little bit on the fence about it, but it sounds interesting. We're following this woman, Magpie, who is traumatized, has amnesia, stumbles across her own body. I'll let that sink in. And then decides she needs to figure out what happened to her because obviously she cannot remember. So I don't know if we're following her ghost or what the deal is there, but it sounds like there's some kind of experimental things happening here, experimental treatments, technology, some kind of a multiverse aspect of this. And there's also this mysterious predator known only as Silhouette, which she is running from in this race against time, insanity, to figure out what the hell is going on. And in doing so, she discovers the hidden secrets of her past, her potential, and her future. Okay, next one, we have a crime thriller that I'm interested in. It's called The Butcher and the Wren. This is released on September 13th. And this is written by Elena Yurkort. I think is how you say her name. I'm not sure. Um, comes out September 13th. This is 256 pages. So the perfect length for me. Um, and she apparently is the co host of a podcast called Morbid, which I've heard of, but don't I don't listen to that one. I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts, but not that one. And this is her debut novel. It's told from two perspectives. You have a notorious serial killer and a medical examiner. It's giving me blindsided energy. And I don't know her writing, but if it's anywhere near Karen Slaughter potential, then it could be great. Set in Louisiana, also giving me Karen Slaughter, Southern vibes. Um, you have this killer who has a penchant for medical experimentation. So if she does delve into those details, 
I might like it. The killer is taunting the authorities who are desperately trying to keep up. And then meanwhile, you have forensic pathologist Ren Muller, or Mueller Muller. Um, and she's the best there is. She's at the top of her game. She has a particular extensive knowledge about historical crimes. So apparently she's going to take that encyclopedic knowledge and use that to help her solve this case. I like that it's not a, a detective. It's a medical examiner. Again, reminding me of Karen Slaughter. I can't I'll keep saying it because that's what this sounds like to me. And it does say it's an addictive read with straight from the morgue details, which I like. That is promising. Only an autopsy technician could provide. I wonder if the author is an autopsy technician. On September 27th, we have another one of my most highly anticipated books, and that is We Spread by Ian Reed. This is 304 pages, and we're following Penny, who is an artist. She's getting a little bit older. She's lived in this apartment for decades. She keeps all of her little memories from her past around. And she's resigned to the mundane rituals of her life until she starts to slip. Before her partner passed away years ago, arrangements were made for her, unbeknownst to her, to set her up in this care facility, a unique long-term care residence. And after she's had one too many incidents, she finds herself at this care facility. At first, she really loves it. She's getting to know the community, she's making friends, she even starts painting again, so she's really enjoying the atmosphere, but the days start to blur together and she starts to have this sense of distrust, this sense of unease surrounding this place that she's at, she starts to lose her grip on reality. So we're asking, is she succumbing to old age? Does she have signs of dementia? Or is she an unknowing participant in something more unsettling and more sinister? Given that this is by Ian Reed, I really hope this is about experimentation. Obviously, I wouldn't wish this on a real person. But like, I hope where this is going is that her partner kind of signed her up for this experimental thing that's researching about memory and trying to probably trying to cure dementia, something like that. I love that this is following an older woman. I don't feel like we have enough representation for aging people in the novels that we read. And especially because this is from Ian Reid, I'm expecting a mind blowing twist. I'm expecting this to be really psychological. If you don't know, this is the author of I'm Thinking of Ending Things, which is one of my all time favorite books. And he also wrote Faux, which I really enjoyed as well. There's always a psychological twist and I just love his writing so much. I'm really, really looking forward to this one. And I'm hoping it's going to be one of those shocking ones that just blow my mind. Also on September 27th, we have Leech by Huron Ennis. This is 336 pages and this is a debut novel. It says it's gothic science fiction and it also says think Wuthering Heights with worms. Again, worms. I'm here for it. I want to be grossed out. I think it's awesome. It says in an isolated chateau as far north as north goes. I don't know where this is set, just north. The Baron's doctor has died and his replacement has a mystery to solve, and that's discovering how the Institute lost track of a body. Where did the body go? In this scenario, trying to find the cure for human disease. For hundreds of years, Interprovincial Medical Institute has grown by taking root in young minds and shaping them into doctors, replacing every human practitioner of medicine. So they've basically like infiltrated doctors. The Institute is here because they think they know what's best for society and they're going to cure and cut and curate this group of human beings to be what they think is best for everybody. One of those situations. The Institute will discover a competitor for its rung at the top of the evolutionary ladder. A parasite is spreading through the Baron's castle. Already a dark pit of secrets lies violence and fear. The two will make war on the battlefield of the body. Whichever wins, humanity will lose again. I think this is going to be gross. I think it's going to be interesting. It's going to be near futuristic. If it's well done, this could be really, really good. And that's going to be it for me today, y'all. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. If you're new, welcome. If you're not new, welcome. We are inclusive here. I love you all. I appreciate you so much. Don't forget to hit that like button if you liked this, if you are so inclined, hit the subscribe button, all the things. And of course, don't forget that life is short. 
So read Riley. Cheers and goodbye.